doubt that the odd solutions will have a negative sign here. Yeah, you are you are absolutely right. I'm sorry I didn't understand what you were saying uh, on Tuesday, but uh, it's true because the when x is less than zero for the negative segment of x, the wave function should simply be minus psi of minus x. So that means uh, that you should simply have a minus sign over here. Okay. And here I'm not flipping the sign because my k can suitably take a different uh, value so that that part is taken care of. Okay. So you were right. This will have a minus sign over here. So that is for this part. Then we finished the solution for the five square well for the bound states. And we saw that it will have at least one state which is even and the odd states uh, if, if you have a large enough well you have odd states alternating with the even states now the other uh, part of the solution so the finite square well potential are the scattering states so these are states where the energy is more than v0 which means that the particle does not get trapped in this well okay so here the zero is the uh, energy level for the free particle. So uh, if you have a particle which has an energy more than V0, then it will not fall into the well. But its path or wave function will be modified by the well, and then it will continue on. OK, so what can happen to a wave when it encounters some sort of potential? It can get reflected partly, or it can get transmitted. And in between, it will uh, show some sort of modification. So again, we have three uh, segments. We split the wave function into three segments, one, two, and three. And the first part is the free particle on the left. So this is the free particle wave function that we have uh, derived before. And again, you have a free particle solution on the right, so in section three. And in the middle, the form is still the same as the bound particle. So it is a combination of the sine and cos function. OK. Now, for a scattering state, normally you have a, a traveling electron and you follow what happens to it. Okay. So, in our case, for this example, we will consider an incident electron moving from left to right. So, it comes from uh, the side of section 1, then it gets modified by the potential in section 2, and then it continues on partly in section 3. Okay. Now, you could have had again a particle moving from the right to left then coming from three or you could have had particles coming from both directions but to keep things simple we will only consider one particles coming only or electrons coming only from one direction so then if uh, if you remember our free particle solution the uh, component with the positive exponent so a e to the uh, power i k x that represented the uh, elect uh, a motion from left to right and the minus i k x represented right to left okay uh, uh, so then if my incident electron is from left to right then i can consider that the a e to the power i k x represents the incident electron then b e to the power minus k x so that is the right to left electron in region one represents the reflected electron, if any. Then uh, on in part three, you have F e to the power ikx, so left to right. So this would be the transmitted electron. And to have an electron from right to left in three, you need to have some source on the right. This transmitted electron cannot just reverse its direction in the absence of potential. So we can discard this G part since we have not considered any electrons coming from the right. Okay. So then, then this leaves us A, B, C, D, F, and K. K and L. So these are things we need to determine. Okay. And we also have four boundary conditions. So th these are the general boundary conditions that we spoke of, which any valid wave function has. That is, it is. Uh, it must be continuous, and its first derivative should also be continuous. So here we have four, uh, two points where 
where we should check the continuity that is minus a and a that gives me four boundary conditions the continuity of psi at a then psi at minus a d psi dx at a and d psi dx at minus a so this is what we have uh, written here so the wave function at uh, from psi, uh, from section 1 equal to the wave function from section 2 at minus a then I take derivatives of the two sides these also should be equal and again the same thing at a okay this is between sections 2 and 3 uh, now if you look at these uh, four equations then you eliminate C and D then you will obtain a relation between B and F okay. this is a bit of a long derivation but it is just algebra so you can uh, try it out uh, yourselves and I will uh, upload the algebra also on we learn after a few days if you don't manage to do it yourself you can look there if this is just algebra you just uh, just add subtract these four equations to get this basically Okay, just have to do it in an organized manner so you, you eliminate the right things okay so now i have a relation between b and f and f and a so b is the amplitude of the reflected wave f is the amplitude of the transmitted wave a is the amplitude of the incident wave so from these quantities uh, we can define some coefficients so there's something called a transmission coefficient which is defined as the mod square of f by mod square of a so transmitted wave by incident wave okay and if you evaluate this from again uh, these relations you get the transmission coefficient as this complicated expression well yeah so let me mention here you don't need to memorize these expressions okay uh, actually the scattering um, states are not normally taught in a chemistry course uh, but uh, I wanted the discussion to be complete, so I'm discussing this, but I'm not going into all the details. And I will also not ask about the details. Okay, so this is just so that you have an overview of where the scattering states come from, especially those who will do physics later on. You will deal a lot uh, with the scattering states, so it's good to know how they relate to the bound states. And if you have a quantum physics course, you will, of course, do scattering states in more detail, I would presume. So this is the transmission coefficient and then if you take 1 by t, uh, you get this expression. From this, what you see is if the second term is somehow 0, you have perfect transmission. So t equal to 1. So when does the second part become 0? So when the argument of sine is n pi, of the sine square term is n pi, then this term will become 0. And this condition... Uh, Okay, no, wait, let, let me just complete the definitions first. So just like the transmission uh, coefficient, you also have a reflection coefficient defined analogously as the amplitude square of the reflected wave and the amplitude square of the incident wave. You can also derive a relation for this and you will get something. And you can also verify if R plus T is 1 as it should be because these are uh, so these are like the fractions of the incident wave which are reflected and which are transmitted. So the sum should turn out to be one. You can try and verify that if you like. Mm. Now coming back to the case of the perfect transmission. So what, what energies of the way of the particle allow it to be perfectly transmitted? That is given by this condition where the argument is n pi. So setting this to n pi, you get that the energy E plus V zero takes on some quantized values uh, where the quantum number is n and since we have studied the particle in a one dimensional box you can immediately see that these energies correspond exactly to the uh, energies of the bound states in the one dimensional uh, particle in a box. Now this is a very startling result because uh, there was no reason for this to be the case. Like what what possibly can be the connection between a transmitted wave and a bound wave and two totally different potentials. So here we have a finite uh, potential well and there we have an infinite well and there the particle was in a bound state. Here this is a scattering state. But 
this is what is called resonant transmission so the so this uh, so these energies they turn out to be the same and if you and experimentally they were found it was really found that energies which correspond to these values they are resonantly transmitted so they simply move over the well as if they as if it wasn't there in a way okay uh, so i will not go into further details over here uh, this is again a field of research and there are very and many experiments which rely on this phenomena okay uh, but uh, it's sort of beyond the scope of a basic quantum mechanics course we will not go into that now so this was sort of a little overview of scattering states and where they come from and how both scattering states and bound states can coexist which is of course true in case of all uh, molecules so you will have uh, these molecules which have bound states and also if you have an uh, electron which is uh, thrown at this molecule and it gets scattered it this uh, wave function of this electron also gets modified by the molecule and these and if you trace the path of these scattered electrons then also you get information about the molecule and then the scattering analysis of scattering states they become important Okay, so this was the end of our last lecture, which I didn't manage last time. So, if any of you have questions now on any of the previous lectures, I can take them now. Because today we will uh, start with something new, the harmonic oscillator, and that is like a totally different sort of analysis. So if you have questions here. no okay then then let's just start with the harmonic oscillator problem so so all of you have heard or have done derivations of the simple harmonic oscillator as a classical uh, as a classical model okay right so it is simply what is a simple harmonic oscillator it is simply a mass on a spring and it is oscillating and for oscillations to occur what you need is that the restoring force be proportional to the displacement of the mass or to the extension of the spring however you want to think about it so the idea is that if as you move the mass away from its equilibrium position if the force increases then at some point the restoring force will overtake the uh, forward force and the particle mass will come back resulting in a oscillatory motion and this is an idea of the force of the restoring force gives me the equations for the harmonic motion so the force is then proportional to the displacement and it acts opposite to the displacement is the restoring force and the proportionality constant is called the spring constant okay and this force uh, by Newton's second law is equal to the mass into the acceleration of the particle and this gives me the differential equation that must be solved to get the uh, motion of this mass os oscillating mass and the solution as we have used time and again in this course is a sine omega t plus b cos omega t where omega is the angular velocity which is uh, given by k by m k is spring constant m is the mass uh, the energy of this system at any point is a sum of the kinetic and potential energies the kinetic energy is half mv squared or p squared by m uh, p squared by 2m as however you like to put it and the potential energy can be derived as half kx squared now the now from the fact that omega is equal to root of k by m I can also write half kx square as half m omega square x square. Yeah, this is somehow conventionally the form in which the Hamiltonian for the quantum harmonic oscillator is taken. So we will write instead of half kx square, half m omega square x square, which is no problem, which is exactly true. So no problem. And by using this potential in the Hamiltonian, we get 
the Hamiltonian for the quantum harmonic oscillator. So what is it exactly that we want to solve? We want to find out how a quantum particle would behave in a potential that resembles the classical harmonic oscillator. And what does the class potential for the classical harmonic oscillator look like? It is simply a parabola with uh, the minimum at x equal to 0. So when I write the potential as half kx square or half m omega square x square, I assume that the minimum for this potential is at x equal to 0. And then the potential looks like a parabola which goes up to infinity. Okay. So no real oscillator, of course, has this infinite parabola potential because at some point it would break. Uh, but the, the perfect oscillator is continues to be useful. Why? This is because any sort of oscillatory motion will be in a potential that uh, resembles a parabola at least near the minimum. So if the amplitude of the motion is small enough, then the potential around that point is always a parabola. So uh, solving the harmonic oscillator problem, even the ideal one, is very useful for any sort of oscillatory motion. And uh, this can also be seen from the Taylor expansion of the potential. So if we say that the minimum is at x0, so in, in, in this case, of course, x0 is 0, but OK. So if you expand the potential about a minimum point x0, then you have vx0 plus first derivative of v evaluated at x0 into x minus x0 plus half second derivative of v evaluated at x0 into x minus x0 whole square. So this is what is called the Taylor expansion. Okay. Uh, which assumes that x minus x0 is small enough. Okay? And then you can... Yeah, and then this of course continues to uh, all the higher derivatives as well. So triple derivative, quadruple derivative and everything. And since the minimum of Vx is, is at x0, then V prime x0 is 0. And my first term that tells me what the potential looks like is half V double prime x0, x minus x0 whole square. So this is my parabolic potential. This tells me that any sort of oscillatory motion about a minimum point will have a potential that looks like a parabola. So, the, so then uh, my harmonic oscillator becomes a good model for these situations. Now let us continue with the, the solution of this problem. So I have the Hamiltonian as before. Then I take half m omega square common and I have x square plus p square by m square omega square. Now there are two methods of solving this Hamiltonian. So all this while, what we have done is we have been uh, solving the differential equations in some manner. So we expand out the P operator or whatever other operators we have in the Hamiltonian. We write a wave function and we guess solutions for it, use boundary conditions. And this is what is called a brute force method or just solving the differential equation as a differential equation. But for the harmonic oscillator problem, there is a very smart way of doing this. And it also introduces some new concepts which will help us in solving uh, the Schrodinger equation for more complicated cases later on. So we will do the more interesting way first. And then I will see if we have time. We will also do the uh, brute force method and see if all, if all our results match. So this is what is normally called the algebraic solution or with or a solution with ladder operators or a solution with creation annihilation operators uh, this is also forms the basis of for defining these operators so this 
harmonic oscillator example is very very important and you should make an effort to really understand it well because the techniques that you use now over here you will keep using them for advanced quantum mechanics uh, problems many 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 times okay so the idea over here is that if you can factorize a hamiltonian into two uh, into v dagger v form okay then my solution becomes simple so this is something that is out of experience people have found that if you can somehow factorize the hamiltonian then you can uh, simplify the equation that needs to be solved we will see this it may not be obvious to you right now but this is how we start uh, and why do we take v dagger v uh, and not v v dagger or v v or something else because factorize simply means product right so you could say i, I just want it to be ab uh, form or v w form or something like that. but we take this particular form because then whatever is v then the hamiltonian is assured to be hermitian so if v dagger v if you take a dagger of the full thing you get back v dagger v so whatever we find v to be if it if the hamiltonian is written as v dagger v it is hermitian okay so this is the advantage of writing it like this and in order to write it like this uh it is possible for forms of the hamiltonian where you have a squared plus b squared so not all hamiltonians can be factorized like this but here we have this a square plus b square form and we can we know that we can write a square plus b square as a plus iv into a minus iv and this looks somewhat like a v dagger v form okay but this, but again be careful these are just variables and we need to make sure that this continues to be true for my operators because here i have operators okay and i also know that x and p do not commute from before so uh, there is already a red flag there so let us verify this so can can i do this with the operators let's see so if i do it and i if try to evaluate the product of x plus i p by m omega into x minus i p m omega then what do i find then i have x x x squared and then again this term is minus i square so plus p square m square omega square so this part i have got back as i would like but here for the term px so the second term from the first bracket and the first term from the second bracket i get px and when i take the first term from the first bracket and the second term from the second bracket then i get xp and we know that for operators you cannot simply interchange positions so xp is not necessarily px so we maintain the distinction and we write it as the xp commutator okay i think you have evaluated the xp commutator before but we can do it again for revision so to find out the action of operators you take a trial function and you operate the operate on it and p has the form minus i h cross del del x so what have we done so here i have x which remains as x and p acting on f that is the derivative and here p act, will act on x into f so i have to use the product rule and have two terms one of which cancels with the first term and i'm left with ih cross f and so my commutator has the value ih cross fine so then i can put back ih cross over here and i see that my factorized form has an extra term h cross by m omega okay does that mean i cannot factorize my hamiltonian well not quite we can take a hint from this and write this sum as this factorized for minus a number now since this is just a number there is hope that it will not create much problems and i will still be able to simplify my equation 
Okay. Now, let's see. Uh, fine. So to let's verify if my V dagger V is now her mission. Or rather, uh, okay, so now I have this factorized form, but it remains to be verified that if the second term is defined as V, then V dagger turns out to be X plus IP by M. Oh my God. So this, is, this may not be obvious to everybody at the first glance. So we need to verify this. So how, how do we find out if an operator A is her mission? So the rule is that if, you, if for A to be her mission, my integration of psi star A psi should be equal to integration of psi A psi star. So this is equivalent to saying that the uh, expectation value of A is real. So that is the criteria for determining if an operator A is her mission. So for a matrix A to be her mission, what you need is that the transpose complex conjugate is the same as the original matrix, right? For an operator, you need its expectation value to be real. Okay, so this is the criteria. And we know that P is her mission. Using this criteria, you can verify it that the P operator is her mission. And so P dagger is equal to P. X is also her mission. So X dagger is equal to X. And you have an I here. So the complex conjugation changes the sign of this term. So yes, if you define X minus I P by M omega as V, then V dagger turns out to be X plus I P by M omega. So we have done, a, done the right job. And we can write it now, write the Hamiltonian in terms of V as half m omega squared, which we had taken in common, then the factorized form v dagger v, and this extra term that came from the commutator. Okay. Oh, sorry, maybe I have made a mistake. with the sign over here. So the right hand side is this and I have this. So this should be a plus. So this is a minus. Mm. Seems to be a sign problem here. That's so. So minus i, this is i h cross, so minus i square h, so that's plus. Okay, so I have a minus over here. Can, can any of you see how, what went wrong? So we have a sign issue here, it seems. This. This is the sum. So that is the product. And that must be. product minus this. So how does this become positive here? Have 
done something. This should have been a minus. Minus I this plus okay. this is minus I by it XP commutator. XP commutator is I H cross. So that's minus that's plus. Hmm. What is wrong? I think this turns out to be a minus somehow. I must have made a mistake here. Can any of you see what, what is wrong? This should have been a plus. But I cannot find what is wrong at the moment. Okay, let's see. Let's move on with this and I will I will figure it out and let you know. Okay. <laughs> I must have made a mistake deriving this yesterday. Sorry. So this this would have been a plus, okay, for some reason. And then uh, the Hamiltonian is then uh, V dagger V plus H cross pi. Okay. Now that we have two operators, we are going to uh, find out some relations between them. So we will find out the commutator of V and V dagger. So this is sort of in a, is an attempt to simplify the Hamiltonian further. So we evaluate the commutator. And so there are these two terms. We can take them one by one. So X and X commute, P and P commute. Then you have the PX commutator from here and the XP commutator from here. And PX is minus IH cross and XP is IH cross and we get a value. So the commutator of VV dagger is some real value, 2H cross by M omega. So this gives me a hint that if I rescale my v's with root of m omega by 2h cross then my commutator can be reduced to one so i'm just trying to simplify things trying to put the factors into the definitions so that my working equations become simple okay. so i rescale my v's and then my commutator has a value of one and I define these rescaled V's as A and A dagger. And this is the source of the creation annihilation operators. We, we will see why they are called creation annihilation operators, how they are useful, etc. But this is the primary definition of the operators. They are rescaled operators from the factorization of the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator. Also, A and A dagger we see are not the same. So definitely A is not permission. Okay. So this is the explicit form of A and A dagger, but we will try and avoid using this form as far as possible. We will try to use just this very simple commutation relation and do all the work afterwards. So that, that will be the magic of defining these operators. And if we want to go back to the X and P operators from A and A dagger, which is a simple manipulation of these two equations, and X is then some factor into A plus A dagger, and P is again some factor into A dagger minus now, uh, with these rescaled v, uh, Vs, we can rewrite the Hamiltonian. 
and we have simplified it even further. So we have got now a common H cross omega term, which isolates the energy units in a way. And I have the operator part, which is unit less, and it is A dagger A plus half. So now, this it has become simple, but what we now need to find out is how A dagger and A affect psi, because eventually my Hamiltonian operates on a psi. So I need to, so if I want to use this form, I need to know how A dagger and A affect psi. So let's see. So if I have a wave function which is A psi, for example, and I operate my Hamiltonian on this function, then let's write it as A dagger A plus half and operating on A psi. Then I have these strings of operators. Then I use the commutator to move my uh, A dagger to the right. So I'm writing A dagger A as A, A dagger minus one. So A dagger A equal to A, A dagger minus one. So that is what I am putting over here. Then I can, uh, then I have A, which I can take common over here. And I have A dagger A plus half minus H cross omega. So I am simplifying this algebraically. If you just see that I've taken this A common over here. And then I have. Open this up into a dagger plus half minus one. So I have got back my Hamiltonian here. So I have the a outside, Hamiltonian is back, and I have an a h cross omega energy term over here. Then the action of the Hamiltonian on psi gives me e. This is just a number, it remains as it is. Okay, and then this is again a number, so I can move this out and I get back the a psi wave function that I had started out with. Okay, so I, I am not very careful with putting all the caps for the operators, but I suppose it is obvious to you that all the a's will have hats and all the h's will have hats, etc. Okay, so I I have sometimes put hats and sometimes not just because I was deriving it fast. You can put all the hats if you feel comfortable. So then anyhow, uh, so we have a number again and we get back our old wave function that we operated on. So this is a very nice result. So it tells us that a psi is also an eigenfunction of the Hamiltonian. So if psi is an eigenfunction with energy E, a psi is an eigenfunction with energy E minus H cross omega. So the energy has been reduced by H cross omega. So, so A is in that way nice and neat. Similarly, if we experiment with A dagger psi, you will find that the energy eigenvalue for A dagger psi is E plus H cross omega. Fine. So now we find that if we know find one solution for psi, then I get other solutions very easily. So action of A on psi will give me a new psi, which is also an eigenfunction. Now, knowing A psi, if I act another A on it, this will give me another energy, which is, again, H cross omega lower than A psi, and so on. So I will have a series of solutions from one solution. Also, when I use a dagger, I will get the higher solution. So if I know psi, I will get the next higher solution. Uh, and then again, if I know a dagger psi and I operate another a dagger on it, I will get an even higher solution. Okay. So I will get a whole range of solutions. So this, this is, this starts seeming promising because a has a simple derivative uh, is, is a, just a derivative operator. So while it may be difficult to find uh, 
to solve differential equations to find psi as eigen solutions once just taking a derivative of a function is no big deal okay so if once we find one psi and we can simply take derivatives or which is equivalent to action of a or a dagger then that is an easy way right so we now have sort of a recipe and what and the missing bit is we don't have even one psi now we know how to get other sides from one side now let's start trying to get one side okay. how how do you do that uh, if you remember we had shown that the energy of the state cannot be lower than the minimum value of the potential uh, you can go back i think to lectures and you can see that okay and here the minimum value of the potential is zero so negative energies are disallowed in this problem okay but we see that the action of a on psi lowers the energy by h cross omega successively and i can keep doing this so at some point i will cross zero right so then this those states somehow should be disallowed by my uh, hamiltonian so how uh, so the so the lowering operator must at some point fail to give a valid eigen state okay, so there must be some lowest eigen state and when i act a on this lowest eigen state i should get either zero that is the wave function disappears or somehow this uh, what i get should be an invalid wave function okay, so let's start with the simplest one that if 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 a acting on some lowest eigen function which i call psi zero is zero what can i find out from that so now this is the only time we will use the explicit form of a uh we use the explicit form of a and we get a first order differential equation okay and as you can see this will give me a psi zero okay so this is a much simpler form if you remember the original differential equation that we had it involved x square and p square okay but this is just a simple first order differential equation so we have simplified our problem a lot by defining these a and a dagger operators but here we have just taken the easy way out we have just said that let's assume that a simply destroys my lowest eigen function but nothing has told me that this is the case psi zero uh, the action of a on, on psi zero could have been invalid for some other reason it is not necessary that it will be zero right so let's look at an alternative argument so what is the alternative argument the alternative argument is we look at the expectation value of the hamiltonian for uh some wave function psi so this is my energy as you know the expectation value of the hamiltonian is the energy and then if psi Uh, and then we write write h open out h into the form a, a dagger plus half h cross omega then there are two terms so okay so what have we done here here we have a dagger a on psi and i can move a dagger to the bra by taking a dagger so a dagger dagger is a so i get a psi a psi overlap over here from the first term and the psi 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 overlap from the second term uh psi is taken to be normalized so that's one and a psi a psi this is an overlap so it is always positive irrespective of what the function is so the expectation of value of the hamiltonian for any arbitrary function psi is always higher than half h cross so half h cross omega is the lower bound to the energy spectrum in this case so this is the minimum energy that the that any arbitrary state can have and 
When will this happen? This will happen when Asi, Asi is 0. And using this condition that Asi, Asi is 0, this is only possible if Asi itself is 0. So we are back to what we had chosen over here, that A Psi 0 equal to 0. And even from the second more general argument, we also get A Psi equal to 0. So now that we're convinced that this is the condition for which we get a ground state solution, we solve this first order equation. That is simple enough. You have D Psi 0 dx equal to minus m omega by h cross x Psi 0. Take the x's on one side, size on the other, and you will get this form of the wave function. And if you normalize this, that is also pretty simple. You will get the normalization. Fine. And when you use this wave function to calculate the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, you will also get half h cross omega. You can verify this. So, so now we've got, we, we, we did a very, very simple solution. So, so notice that this was so much simpler than all the problems that we have done before when we, when we explicitly solved a second order differential equation. Okay. But of course you can't do the same trick in the other problems. Okay. So that is why the harmonic oscillator is special. And we have got the ground state. And as we have seen before, once we have one wave function, then a dagger psi will give me the psi zero, will give me the next higher uh, wave, uh, wave function. Then a dagger, a dagger psi will give me the an even higher solution, etc. So, so, so we will just get a nice series of eigen. Uh, Eigen solution, uh, eigen states for my harmonic oscillator problem. Okay, so this is some sort of ending for the harmonic oscillator problem, but there are many, many more interesting things that will come out of this. So let me see if I, I think I should probably just stop here because we will go in a different direction again from here. Uh, Okay, let's, so let me just conclude with this normalization constant over here. So we found the normalization constant for psi 0. However, every time I operate a dagger on psi 0 to get to the next excited state of the problem, uh, the normalization will be lost. So we need... So each individual uh, excited state will have a different normalization constant, and that is given by a n. So I have written a general excited state psi n as the action of a string of a daggers on psi zero, and it is associated with the normalization constant a n. And this has also a very simple form, one by root of n factorial. Uh, we will see, we will derive this in the rest of this lecture, but uh, I, we have run out of time today, so I will do that after the vacation then. But you will have the notes, so you can uh, go through it yourself. I, I will go through it again after the vacation. But it's very interesting, so I, if you are interested, you can go through the rest of the notes where I work out the normalization constant and also the energy eigenstates. Okay? So let's finish here for today. And like I said, I will uh, upload an assignment, but I will give you a long deadline. Okay.